Welcome to An Honorable Profession, a podcast giving America hope since 2018. I'm Ryan Coonerty. Along with Debbie Cox Bolton of the New Deal, I'm lucky enough to be your co-host. Honorable Profession is a New Deal Leaders podcast. The New Deal is an organization that supports the next generation of American leaders. From attorneys generals, to state senators, to mayors, to school board members, these are the people that are pushing policies and politics that will respond to climate change, rebuild our economy, address racial injustice, and restore our democracy. These are incredibly talented people who have dedicated themselves to public service when their country and their communities need it the most. Check out NewDealLeaders.org to see what I'm talking about. Welcome to an honorable profession. I'm Debbie Cox Bolton, CEO of the New Deal. We're proud to support some of the inspiring leaders that you hear on this podcast. In this episode, I talked with Zeb Smathers, the mayor of the small mountain town of Canton in Western North Carolina. We talked about the devastating floods that destroyed much of his town last year and how his community has come together to build back better. We talked about how Democrats can appeal to rural America and how the harrowing birth of his young son has made him an even more vocal advocate for access to respectable health care for all. I was so moved by the mayor's passion for his hometown and small town America, as well as his relentless optimism and practical advice about how we can bridge divides and find common ground. And I hope you'll stay through the end where he issues a very special invitation to visit his hometown on a Friday night this October, when the high school football stadium will finally be reopened and hosting their epic rivals as this community continues to recover. Welcome to an honorable profession. It's my privilege to be here because it it actually is an honorable profession. I didn't talk about that, and I I agree with you. Well, let's start about learning a little bit about this great town that you are mayor of. We are in the mountains, North Carolina, about 20 minutes outside of Asheville. We're a manufacturing town. Uh, We're a blue collar town. We pride ourselves on that. Even in a state like North Carolina, I know where all the people live and the money. But in the state of North Carolina, it's it's a bunch of small towns. There's more Cantons than Charlottes, and they each have a different barbecue sauce and high school football team. But if you understand a place like Canton, you understand a lot of small towns, not just in North Carolina, but across the United States. Uh, The accent may change, uh, just like the barbecue sauce here in North Carolina. But the the challenges, but the promises and you know the potential of places like Canton is a story of so many places across the United States. And truly, and I believe this politically, and, and unless you can create policy and inspire hope in places like Canton, then you're really not doing your job. This is not just about you know urban areas; those are very important. But I think in so many regards, challenges that I see, poverty mental health, access to health care, child care, you know, those are problems of the, the rural class and these small towns, just like they are in the urban areas. And yes, there are differences, but I think part of leadership is finding those common themes to attack. And if we're not looking at solving problems that way, then I think we're doing a disservice. I would rather just want to come out and say, look, I'm just here to solve cities problems and that's it. I get that. At least you're being honest, but that's not what we are. That's not what we should be doing. Uh, There's so much common sense approaches to solve problems, whether you're in places like Canton or or places like Chicago. Much different, but in so many regards, uh, a lot of similarities. I totally agree with that. But I will say that, Canton, you've had your share of challenges and solved over the last year. So for folks who don't know, obviously you, uh, like mayors across the the country, were dealing with COVID, but then you also were hit with this 100-year flood, which was twice uh, in uh, 20 years or whatever it was, and it was devastating and and, and took out a lot of your town. So tell us about what happened and tell us what it's going to, what you're doing to rebuild. You know, in in August, not to get too personal, but again, I'm People are listening to this or involved in politics and leaders, and you can't separate our own personal stories from our political journeys. In August 2nd, we got a phone call from my father where my sister, uh, my youngest sister, her husband passed away suddenly at the age of 47, completely unexpected. He was very involved in the community, was this radio guy for the local high school football team. Everybody knew him. So watching your baby sister go through that's challenging enough. Two weeks later, 
she lost her house in the floods like so many. So as a as a big brother watching your sister lose her home and her house in two weeks, but also your friends, your family members across the county, and literally in a matter of an hour and a half, no one was expecting these floods to happen. And it was a massive a demonic flash flood caused for the remnant of uh, Hurricane Fred. To this day, I still don't have a town hall, a police department, a fire department. We lost major businesses, homes. At one point, I had to jump in the water. We had no time to prepare. But watching the community come together, we lost six people. At one point, we thought it would be upwards of 60. Watching people rebuild, especially people that, you know, in Canton, in, in, in our city limits. Again, our city limits is relatively small. But, the, you know, we provide services for basically half the county. And the county is about 70,000 people. Watching the tenacity of these people have lost everything, their homes, their family members come back and to keep going. Yeah, there were hard days as mayor. But when you look at those type of people, like my sister that lost everything, her home, the family members that keep going, that's what pushes you. But also, I mean, on the political side of things, uh, in the days following, watching people come together, Democrats and Republicans, that just a week before we're feuding over everything from COVID to budgets. You know, what can we do to help? Let's get the money. Let's work together. Being in the same room with people who do not probably agree about a lot, finding those resources for people to help them move on and rebuild. It's a tra- it's tragic. It takes a tragedy to, be, to bring people together. But also I had one of these moments that I think for all of us, once you see people come together over political lines or issue lines to actually get something done, you can't go back. And actually, you don't have to go back. You know, to move us forward as a country, we have to demand better. And once you see that it can be done and it does happen, the only reason we have to settle for the toxicity is if we choose to. And part of that is to stand up to people on both sides and interests that they don't care about solving problems. They care about division. They're making money and having success on the division. And I understand that there's time for politics, but there are people struggling and and people that need help and need leadership. So once you see it, you don't have to go back and you shouldn't go back. And I think that's what, you know, all of us leaders have to have a face. We have to choose which direction are we going to do? Are are, Are we going to search and appeal to the higher angels of our people and our country, or are we going to fly low? That's our choice we have to make. Everything else takes place after that, every decision we make. I think that's so right and true. I've seen it in my own community when we've had devastation over something with mudslides here that killed 20 people. I do wonder, and I completely agree about, you know, need to find a way through this toxicity. But my question to you in terms of lessons you've learned from what, you know, what you all have gone through. And it's so great to hear that, you know, what now, eight months, nine months later, you're still working together to, you know, rebuild. I think a lot of people thought that when COVID hit, for example, we would come together as a country, right? The common enemy, this virus, we had, but, you know, obviously that's not what happened. And we have all these divisions on every single aspect of this. You know, what, is it because, you know, you're a small community where you can see each other and look each other in the eye? And if you can hide behind the internet and say mean things, you can, or like, what, what lessons would you, would you try to extrapolate when we're talking about it, this nationally, you know? Yeah. You, you know, first off, I think, I think there is, I go back to President Obama's book, The Audacity of Hope. In any time you have the audacity to stand up and say, no, we're not accepting that. And, and trust me, I, you know, I don't read comment sections on social media. You can start slipping down that hole and never get out of it. And it, it affects your leadership style. But again, I mean, even with COVID, I think being in local government makes you have to find practical solutions and leadership. And because, again, I've told you this before, when you're a mayor or you're elected locally, they know where to find you. Uh, It's the most responsive level of government. They, they, They will see you in the grocery store. They will see you in the church pews. They will find you. And, and you have to be, you can't run away. You can't hide. You, you've got to answer for your actions and, and listen. And so with that being said, I think it comes to, again, sort of similar to the floods. We can argue about, you know, all sorts of things, but let's understand we have hundreds of thousands of Americans dead since this started. Let's start with our common humanity. Let's start that over just Christmas a few weeks ago and the holidays, 
there were empty chairs at tables because of this virus. Let's start there and understand that there's a common humanity and it, 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 it didn't care about who you voted for, what your belief in, it has affected you somehow. And so I think part of the government is to refocus people. And a lot of times when I'm in meetings with the floods and we get lost on what about this, where we're going to move this, I try to refocus everyone back to saying, look, guys, we lost people, but we lost part of our soul here. Let's let's start there. So again, I think it's the audacity to lead, to refocus and not be distracted ourselves. I mean, people are looking for us to guide us. So we can't be distracted by the stuff that is meant to get us off our game. There's a lot there. Thank you for that. I, I do want to ask a little bit about kind of the, the mechanics of rebuilding, if you will. And, and, and Canton was a small town, paper mill town. Yes. Like a lot of towns, you know, I think you were struggling to keep people in Canton, right? You went away yourself. You grew up in Canton uh, to school and law school, came back. We're thinking about the plans prior to the flood. We're thinking about in terms of you know economic development, bringing people back into the economy. We've been able to do that simply because you know. And look, I went to Duke undergrad law school at UNC. So I'm a mutt when it comes to different types of blues, but I watched Raleigh and Durham uh, and Chapel Hill develop for my seven years down east, and I knew as Asheville and Buckham County, one of our largest counties in the state was growing, it was spread over to Haywood County. But I think the question had to be, what type of community did we want to be? We still, obviously, we're very pro-manufacturing. We're a union town. But we also wanted to grow and bring in new ideas and new people, but we didn't want to lose who we are. And I think part of growing, no matter if it's an organization, a political movement, you got to you got to have a pretty good idea of what your soul is. And you've got to figure out how do you balance that. You can change and you can have you know, you have tons of progress, but you don't want to lose what made you what you are. And we're a blue collar town. We're not just a tourist town. And so for years and years, we try to be something that we're not. As I like to say, if you're going to be damned, be damned for who you truly are. And we're a mill town. We're a manufacturing town. But once we started being who we are, people were drawn to us because I think we live in such a superficial society and so much, you know, smoke and mirrors. When the real thing comes along, we get it because we're so used to chewing on plastic. When, when something good comes along, we know the difference. And I think that we're drawn to that. But even as we rebuild, we have to be very careful. You know, as we rebuild Town Hall and our police station, we just can't rebuild. I mean, to, to steal a line from President Biden, you had to build back better. Because, again, we had floods hit us in 2004. They said, it, oh, it'd be another 500 years. No, we made it 17 years. I've told some of my friends who I'm, you know, may share a little different political beliefs. It is OK to say that climate change is real. No one's going to jump out of the bushes and, and, and get mad at you. We we're on a small river in the mountains of North Carolina. We should not have to deal with a demonic flood like this. Even the old timers never witnessed anything like this, even since 2004. There were places that got flooded that weren't even near the floodplain. There were houses that flooded in 04 that now don't even exist. When I say don't exist, I mean, you couldn't find a piece of that house anywhere. And so we have to start talking about mitigation and what we can do because it will happen again. And we have to acknowledge that in in our weather, again, we can argue about causes, the effects, et cetera. In the same time period as the Canton floods in August, you saw Tennessee, Texas, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, California. It is okay to say our weather weather patterns, it's not just a little storm, it's a horrific storm. It's more they're more intense, they're affecting more lives, they're more expensive. And it's okay to say that is happening because part of being a leader, no matter what your political beliefs are, is to understand what the reality is and go from there. Not with the world you want or you wish or whatever. Again, we're facing this challenge. What are we going to do about it? So as we build back, we're also factoring in the, the changes in the environment and what is happening. Talk about build back better. I mean, of course, that legislation is not passed yet, but there have been significant um, federal legislation passed that are going to bring money to ca- cities and counties and states. American Rescue Plan, the infrastructure bill, namely, as you think about investing in your town for the future, what are the areas where you're looking uh, to make the most impact? Well, to go back, I mean, when I when I ran for basically our city council in 2013, 
we had probably 20% occupancy downtown. We're now up in the high 80s. Uh, we're producing jobs. Uh, we're not losing who we are. And we sort of nicknamed it because everything has a hashtag these days. We, we hashtagged it the Canton Comeback. Because again, so many b- towns like ours in North Carolina, textile, furniture towns, they're gone. I mean, they don't exist anymore. So we, we just, when I first ran, I had to convince people that, look, we can we can do this. It sounds a little hokey, but that's what political slogans are for. I mean, you can look at Canton and for years you saw the word can't. I had to change a mindset to can. Uh, that's just no, I learned that playing, you know, sports growing up. You've got to learn, you've got to learn how to win sometimes. But now it's transitioning. How do we transition from the Canton comeback that's been around for about a decade now to building the hometown of tomorrow? So with the infrastructure money, you know, with a lot of, of grants, not only are we building back, we're looking at, you know, how can we increase broadband access? How can we, you know, increase the ability for uh, electric charging stations? For example, if you're driving from Atlanta, you know, the, your test level will make it very close to here and you need to plug in. Well, you could plug in at Asheville, but what can I do for our economy if I could get you in downtown Canton? You may have never come to downtown Canton, but if you can charge it up for an hour, come to one of our stores downtown, that's a win-win for everybody. It's also things like exploring outdoor recreation. You know, in April, we're going to open up a 450 uh, outdoor recreation park, mountain biking, hiking, picnicking. It was it was going to be a, a mountain that um, I was told that if it wasn't going to be us getting it, it was going to be a rock quarry. So, again, we've been able to preserve a mountain, preserve these, these, these wetlands, turn it over to outdoor recreation. That's going to be a, you know, a tourism economic booster it's, it's things like that. I mean, truly with the opportunity, and it's nice having money to do it. Uh, and so, it, you know, we, we talk about dreams. Well, dreams of money, you know, create realities. So that's what we're doing. But every aspect, we're stopping and saying, what can we do to partner with people, find the money to, you know, truly, uh, again, build back better. Uh, it's, it's a great slogan, but it's the truth. And so money's out there. And so we're not going to let that opportunity uh, just uh, float away no pun intended. So why can't we to come to Canton and see some of that? I'm going to ask about that in a little bit. Absolutely. I want to ask you, you know, obviously you've talked a little bit about politics and you are a democratic mayor in a pretty red part of mm-hmm. what do you attribute your success to? And what do you think we can learn from you in terms of how Democrats need to talk to rural voters? Well, I'll credit the new deal to this. It was the last speaker at our meeting in November from the, the Boston Globe. What she said, it was a eureka moment, and it's something that I've tried to lean into. And we talk about a lot of issues, you know, about, you know, a lot of COVID issues. We all encounter people that disagree uh, and probably vote for someone different than we do. It's easy to dismiss people and just say, ah, oh, that's crazy, or that doesn't make any sense, or, Gee, you know, that's off of Facebook or whatever. That's easy to do. And in some regards, there are still people out there. There are some issues and feelings that absolutely have no place of legitimacy, especially dealing with everything from, you know, racism to just, I mean, just there's some there's some things that just don't get you, you that don't get any type of le- legitimate, you know, afterthought. However, even someone who completely may disagree and you initially think are a little bit out there and like, how could you possibly think that? Stop. Listen. Have a conversation. Ask the question, why do they feel that way? What got them to that point? And in doing so, in listening, something will reveal themselves to you of why they feel that way. And at that point, you might find some common ground or at least a way to go forward. And it may not change how they feel on that issue, but you're listening. And guess what? They won't feel like they've just been dismissed. Or that you don't you don't care about them because something that's happening and pushing people into different tribes is feeling that the other tribe doesn't care, doesn't appreciate them. They just don't see themselves. There's there's no middle ground because they're just dismissed. And again, it's on both sides of the issue. It starts the conversations. It's trying to find common ground because I have I have yet to find someone who I don't that may disagree with me politically or, or didn't you know vote for someone different, then I can't find something that we agree on. And I think there's so many things that we're going through. I see it, again, I don't get paid anything to be mayor, so I can't quit my day job as an attorney. I see it with opioids. Uh, I see it with mental health. 
I see it with childcare. I see it with education. You got to look at certain issues and, and see what you can solve there. And once you do that, there'll be a time and place for politics and all that. But there's plenty of cooperation, respect that can be gained. Like, for example, just uh, but I think you have to go into it. like a week ago. I went to the Republican headquarters for their annual meeting and I spoke to say thank you. Now, I think some of them looked at me like they were witnessing, you know, uh, a horrific nightmare happening or something, or they were thinking I was going to switch parties or something. But I wasn't there to be political. I was there to say thank you because they deserve to thank you. And they were there and they were helping out and they didn't care what your political party. It's OK to do that. Um, we don't have all the right answers on the Democratic side. The Republicans don't have all the right answers. That's OK. But you got to listen and look for the things you can agree on and start there. If you were going to advise, say, the National Democratic Party, how to find that common ground, how to talk to people in a way that makes them understand that they, you know, that you, you share common values, what, what would that, some of that advice be? I, I don't know how long you have on here, the, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's difficult. Again, I, I think there's a lot on the national level because of, of D.C. I caught the political industrial complex and we're guilty as the other side is. We have our issues. We have our this is what we're doing. It's OK to be a party that has diverse opinions. But I think there's a situation that most Americans want us to accomplish things. And I think when you're in local government, you put a premium on getting things done. I, I do believe that most Americans are in the middle. I, I, I just do. I believe in a moderate majority. Time and time again, that's reinforced. Sometimes not as public as they'll say behind the scenes. But most Americans, and I see this, I think most politicians, we really mess up the, what the American dream is. Most Americans, I think, believe that if you work hard, play hard, stay out of trouble, that you will provide your kids an opportunity to have a better life than you. It may be a little bit bigger paycheck. It may be a little bit longer vacation or a, shine, a little bit shinier car. But they want to feel like there's, they're pushing the ball down the field. Our job is to find solutions to help Americans have that opportunity for their kids and to push their family name and their background a little bit farther down with respect and hard work. But I just feel we just don't fuck like anything's getting done and we get lost in the back and forth. And it just really sends mixed signals. And I don't see how most Americans can look at D.C. on either side and be proud of what they're saying because nothing's getting done. And then when you do fight for things, I, I am a very big proponent of voting rights, independent redistricting. You know, but if you fix that, everything else will take care of itself. But I just see I see even that message from the Democrats lost and all the other the fights we get into and get our and get our eye off the ball. I, I think, again, looking at local government leaders, the Democrats are in local government across the United States. And, yes, it's a little self-serving and finding a Democratic message and future around local government and those accomplishments. Because when you're in local government, you're touching every single part of a person's life, whether it's trash pickup, water, police, fire. We touch it all. Flooding, natural disasters. That's the Democratic message. Uh, and, and I think that is where the party has a future. Uh, but there are definitely the ones of us that are elected Democratic officials down here. We look at D.C. sometimes and just scratch our head because it, it does. It makes my job more difficult where I'm located. I mean, I have to get grief over National Party things. But, you know, I mean, I hate to use your name out for clicks and all that. But um, sometimes I hear something about AOC. Well, I, I get that. But you know what? I don't care so much about AOC. I care about what are you doing for WNC, which stands for Western North Carolina. You know, I'm not going to get distracted by national stuff. I, I don't, I've never met her. She's far, far away from Canton. I want to know what are you doing to help my people? And that's what I had to do when, because it took a long time for us to get our FEMA declaration. And I had to, with the White House, say, look, our people out here, yeah, probably most of them did not vote for the president. And I don't think it was anything personal. I think it was just a lot of just bureaucratic stuff. But I had to say, these people deserve every single resource and opportunities anyone else in these United States. And you got to go to bat for them. I don't care if they voted for or against me. I just think local government teaches you that. And man, do I think there's an opportunity for Democrats with that messaging 
across the United States. Because again, just like I said, there are a lot more Cantons in these United States than there are Charlottes or Chicago's. I know there, I know a lot of people, but even in big cities, boroughs, neighborhoods, they're a bunch of small towns. They are. And so I really hope the Democratic Party starts looking to mayors, large and big cities and towns for a way forward. Talk a little about how you ended up in local government. And raised, also a mayor. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering, you know, how what was that like having a father that was a mayor? I always think that this was where you were headed. Well, you know, I grew up. I was born in '82. My granddad, who opened actually my law office that I sit in right now, uh, he opened the first modern supermarket in the '50s and '60s in Camp. He did not have separate facilities for African Americans. He let African Americans buy on credit. How he talked with people and loved people, it was true. He was a Christian in the, the truest loving sense. He died when I was 11. Uh, no person had a bigger effect on my life than my grandfather, even when I was 11 years old. But I remember my grandmother was in shock, and I get a uh, phone call from Governor Hunt. Jim Hunt, you know, to this day, you know, no offense to Governor Cooper. I mean, he still sort of feel, we feel like he's the acting governor. But when you're a child 11 years old and the governor calls you to send his condolences, you start realizing, wait a second here, what, what exactly are we involved in? But we, we were very political, but not elected positions. In 1999, my father ran for mayor. Uh, I was in high school. So, yeah, it took a long getting used to. But dad, in some regards, was a, I say, a man out of time because some of his ideas were so forward thinking, to be honest with you. I'm the one that was able to sort of take those ideas and see them come to fruition because he saw Kenton that was probably a decade behind where he thought it was. And so, yeah, there's a lot of issues that I've you know been able to watch, but watching, being part of those conversations, but really going off to school, coming back and seeing the opportunities and knowing going back, this is where I wanted to call home. But this place has been so good to myself and my family and puts food on our table. And, and I have friends that are mill workers and ditch diggers and police officers and judges and When you grow up in small towns, you just have a deep appreciation for everybody. Even as a lawyer, if that mill worker doesn't get paid, I don't get paid. No one is better than anyone else. It teaches you a sense of blue collar equality where everybody has a story. Everybody should be treated with respect and nobody is better than anybody else. And I think that's sometimes lost on this world that, I mean, really, you just learn a deep appreciation. So I saw this place that I saw potential. I also knew what was happening in Asheville. A lot of people thought I was crazy, that I was making a, a crazy bet of where the future was heading. I didn't think it was so crazy. And I, I, I've been proven I wasn't crazy after all. And it it, it does come, but it, it brings challenges like affordable housing and, and you know, transportation and, and, and water supplies. So we were able to get a little bit ahead of ourselves on that. But to be honest with you, this place has been really, really good to myself and my family. And I think you have an obligation and responsibility to give back. If you've been blessed, your job is to get involved and give back. It doesn't mean you have to be elected. But I see it here. I, I encourage a lot of young people. It's time to get off the sidelines and into the arena and into the game. And you have to. You know, we are, we are very dependent. When I look at D.C. on both sides of the party, we have to have new young leaders carving the way and having the audacity to ask the questions, to make the sacrifice. And they may win or lose, but at least you're in the arena. I'm a huge Teddy Roosevelt guy. Teddy Roosevelt's my favorite president, and I believe in the man in the arena and dusting it up. And we need leaders that are prepared to say, look, no, let's let's make some changes. I mean, we talked a minute ago, you mentioned, I guess, at the top about this being an honorable profession. You know, it's not a money-making opportunity to be, you know, so, you know, I, I really respect and appreciate you and all of your colleagues who, you know, get out there and put themselves forward. You know, it's a sacrifice to be out there and be so public and, to, you know, have everyone know you in the grocery store, you know, and all but, um, you know, that's what makes this country work, that people are stand, you know, ready to stand up and do that. And so is there any kind of other advice you have for people who are out there thinking about, about running besides just do it? <laughs> Don't read comment sections. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it is scary to me. I mean, people are always asking, what's next? What's next? I mean, I'm going to put my family through that. And, you know, again, it goes to almost a sense of equality. I tell a lot of my, my clients this. You dig deep on anybody, anywhere, 
I don't care what you do for a living. I don't care how much money you make. You're going to find something. Every one of us are sinners. Every one of us have failed. Every one of us are ashamed of something in our past. And we continuously screw up from time to time. No one's perfect. The idea that we're searching for this perfect, you know, heroic person that's going to solve all of our problems is not happening. And so we're all flawed, but in but in recognizing that, there's a peace. And I think it gives you a earnest sense of place to lead because you're not here to solve those answers. You're there to give opportunities and say, I'm just here trying to give you, you know, give you all the resources and hope to go on. And sometimes even in the floods, you know, when you're a when you're a mayor and someone's lost everything and they just need someone to hug and just say better days are ahead. You don't need a degree for that. You don't you don't need a you don't need a PR person for that. You just need empathy and understanding that common humanity. And if we start there, again, everything else will sort of fall into place. If you start thinking, what if I lost my home or what they're going through? Every other choice we have to make really becomes a little easier. Again, this the politics, it's, it's a human sport and it's how you approach it and what you look after it. And again, you, and the other advice I would say is you need someone in your life that brings you back down to earth. Because if you, if you get good in this business, you're around a lot of people who are going to tell you how good you are, or the press is this, and you start you start believing, you start reading your own press and you start believing it. That's when, call it karma, call it the political gods, whatever you may think it is, that's when you get zapped. You need someone in your life bringing you back down to earth to remind you that, hey, you ain't that good. I always thought that was one of the greatest traits of President Obama uh, was Michelle. And you got to have someone like that because this politics is a beast and it's easy to get stuck in the trap and you can't lose. You can't forget where you come from. You need people to remind you because that's all all of us, no matter where we go, we all have a story and we always we have some place we grew up. And those are the years that formed you. And for me, it was Canton. And if I ever get to a place that I forget where I come from and the people that I'm fighting for and the principles I'm fighting for, I need to call it a day. I just do. That and you know, you recently became a father not too long ago. As I'm listening to you talk about the people you're fighting for and the people who ground you, how did becoming a, a father kind of impact the way you think about public service? Yeah, uh, Stone, uh, I have a 20, actually, he's 22 months today. Uh, so my wife, Ashley, is not, it's our first child. We had a very traumatic uh, birth experience uh, that was, was not expected or asked for, and dealing with those issues. It's hard. It's tough watching your watching your um, your child and your wife go through that. There's a lot of things I can do, but I think there's all points in our life we just feel helpless and we just have to pray and keep going and hope the best. But we also have to understand. I think it's a major issue out there right now. It's it is healthcare, and healthcare is such a big word. Healthcare means so many things. I think for most people, again, you got to look at it pretty straightforward and say, look. You've got to have a belief and hope, no matter where you are in this country, how much money you have in your pocket or don't have. If you are dealing with health issues, especially ones that are completely out of your control or unasked for, you need access and the respect to having the ability to fight and make some decisions. And yes, you have to be proactive. I think any type of health care, it needs to involve healthy eating and exercise and, and mental health and and all of that. I'm a big proponent of mental health, especially being in the, in the criminal justice world. But access to health care should not be defined by the money in your pocket or the zip code on the bill that the, the hospital sends you. And, you know, and it really going through a traumatic, horrible situation has opened my eyes to health care other than rupturing my Achilles when I was uh, in CrossFit many, many years ago. I, I never, you know, I didn't have a broken bone. I wasn't sick. But watching people go through it and the challenges that we faced, I cannot imagine for people that are in situations they don't have law degrees or teaching degrees or they know certain people. No, those people are the ones that we're fighting for. Uh, people like people like me. I'm, you know, if I've got a healthcare issue, I'm gonna be fine. I have health insurance. You know, I, I go to the gym. I try to eat relatively well. But as Democrats and even Republicans, we got to fight for the ones that don't. And the cost and affordability and access to health care 
for people in places like Canton, it's atrocious. It's really, I think it's a moral issue because these are people that are facing death and destruction and the respect they're given. And they say, hey, basically, we don't have a place for you. We can't help you or you can't have this access. You're making a moral decision on their life or their child's life. So I saw things I'll never be able to unsee. But again, I don't know where my political futures lie, but absolutely. I, it, it, the fight for health care and, and, and for good health care and respectful health care. There's no doubt that's I'll be fighting for that to my last dying breath, simply because what I've not just saw with my own personal family, but others, especially ones fighting addiction, you know, the expand, the you know, expansion of health care. Again, I tell people out here, if you're not willing to expand what we're able to, you know, with Medicaid and Medicare, how can we ask some of these people to fight the opioid addiction without giving them any tools to do so? Like you can't say I'm for beating this opioid addiction unless you're using every tool and weapon to fight that war. You just, that doesn't, you know, doesn't that you can't do that. I'm sorry for what you and your family went through. And I, I just appreciate you sharing that story with us because I do think it's important for our listeners to understand. And they, they know from listening to this podcast, you know, people's experience, you started this at the beginning, shape their, you know, outlook, shape their values, shape their, uh, what they're going to fight for. You know, your experience with healthcare and it echoes so many people's around the country is just really inspiring. And I, and I appreciate that. I, I want to end on a final question that um, we've been asking mayors who have come on the show to, to be tour guides for a minute about their town. 24 hours in Canton, North Carolina. What, what must I do in those 24 hours? Well, let's, let's put those 24 hours about October what should be some, I think October 14th. It'll be a Friday night this fall. Our football stadium, hopefully, will be open before then, but possibly that night. It will be the 100th anniversary of Canton versus Waynesville. Waynesville is the county seat. They're the tourism place. We're the blue collar uh, river town. There will be at least 13,000 people in this football stadium. On this day, uh, we, would get, we would get you some good food downtown, but we take you to this game, and you would see a moment of about probably at this game, about 15,000 people. On the field, I'm demanding that the politicians, uh, Governor Cooper, Senator Tillis, Senator Burr, all the ones in Raleigh that came in those to come back, this football field was destroyed. It's Pisgah Memorial Stadium. Unlike a lot of the uh, places, it's not named after a corporate sponsor or some business person. It's Pisgah Memorial Stadium. It honors our war dead, especially from World War II in Vietnam. There's statutes there. You're going to see us honoring the, the Swift Water Rescue teams and police and fire that came from all across North Carolina and all across the South to help us. You're going to see people back on a football field, not just for a football game, which has been named the greatest high school rivalry in North Carolina, but it's going to be a moment of everyone coming together to realize how far we've come since August of 2021. And you're going to see smiles on faces and there are going to be people in that crowd who have lost homes and lost family members for all sorts of reasons. But for a couple of hours, we're going to concentrate on two towns in the trenches fighting each other on a probably great, beautiful fall evening. And for a couple of hours, we're not going to have to think about all the division and the problems we have, that there's going to be smiles and there's going to be laughter returned to a place that was just covered in destruction just so many months ago. So I think if I was going to give anyone a tour, I'd give them that moment at a football stadium in the South on a Friday night this fall and say, look what can happen if you just come together and you try. And again, I just to, to take a quote from President Clinton, I'll probably mess it up, but there's nothing that's wrong with America that cannot be fixed what is right about America. And if we let that be our guiding light and our North Star politically, we're, we're going to be fine. And we have to be fine because we live in the greatest country and that is okay to say that, but our, but our obligation is to, to keep it that way. And to pass it and make it a little bit better than when we found it. So that's uh, that would be my tour of Ken. Literally. Thank you for that. And I'm uh, going to buy my tickets online as soon as possible. Well, please do. Please do. So we'll get you, we'll get you VIP seats down by the river. Thank you so much. Thank you for, you know, sharing this beautiful picture of your community and for 
your service uh, to not just your to your town, but to to the country. And just always so great to talk to you. And thanks for being. Debbie, we are we are in it together, and I wouldn't be here without you know, your friendship and leadership. And uh, you're doing the Lord's work. And, and like I said, it, it was when I was in D.C. for that meeting, look around that room with all those leaders and you bringing them together. There, there's tough days and I've experienced tough days. But but, you know, you do realize we have every resource and, and person out there that can help make this better. And, and you and you bring in us and the New Deal bringing us together that was a special moment forever changed my life and leadership skills. And, and I just, uh, I know there's tough days and days you may question certain things, but y'all are doing a great job. And thank you for that. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to an honorable profession. Please subscribe to hear more amazing leaders and keep asking your elected officials to be honorable. Boots Road Group produces podcast. I'm Ryan Coonerty, and because we keep things honorable, no tax dollars were used in the making of this podcast.